Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Good morning to everybody. Thank God for His grace. Amen. If it weren't for the grace of God, we'd all be dust. We'd all be toast. Yes, right? right. So, um, Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, we thank you for the opportunity for us to gather together in your name. And we welcome you, Lord. We welcome the Holy Spirit as our teacher. We welcome you as our helper and as our comforter. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, as the one who has baptized us with power. And we welcome you, Lord, as the one who continually fills us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Who's got the first one? Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, 17 to 23. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of you that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened that we may know and comprehend what is the hope to which you have called us, that we may know and comprehend what are the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of your power toward us who believe, according to the working of your great might, that you worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And you put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Amen. <clears throat> Ephesians three sixteen through 21. <clears throat> Father, in Jesus' name we also pray that according to the riches of your glory, you would grant us to be strengthened with power through your spirit and our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we, being rooted and grounded in agape love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the agape love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to you, Father, who are able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to to your power at work within us, to you, Father, the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. 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 So we've said it before. God wants us to get it. He really wants us to get it. He wants us to understand his, his amazing love for us. He wants us to, to really grasp the power that he has for us. Yes. The same power that he raised Jesus from the dead and set him in his own right hand. He has that power towards us, you know, for us to be, for us to be living and operating. And basically, you know, he's got that power towards us. <coughs> and anyway, let me move on. So I'm going to do a quick review of last week, last two weeks ago. Um, more or less a uh, review. I'm probably adding a few things here and there, but. Um, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. That was really a big part of, of what we talked about a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> Going will take you out of your comfort zone. Right? When's the last time you gave a homeless person some love? It's out of my comfort zone. When's the last time I gave a homeless person some love? It's out of my comfort zone, Right? When's the last time you put your arms around someone that might have cooties and told them that you love them and Jesus loves them? <laughs> okay. That's a hard one. That's a hard one. Um, but that's what Jesus would do. Right? In fact, that's what Jesus did. Um, discipling takes time. Sometimes we need to get in the dirt, so to speak. We need to go where Jesus would go. We need to understand that Jesus will send us as far as it takes to meet somebody, right? And to bring somebody to him and to disciple him. He will send us to the ends of the earth if we're willing to go. Well, I just don't feel led. This is kind of a tough one. I just don't feel led to do that. You want to know God's 
will, read the Bible. What's God's will? Read the Bible cover to cover, particularly the New Testament. What's God's will? What does the Bible say? You want to walk in the Spirit? Then do what the Bible says. Do the Bible. Walk in the Spirit? Do the Bible. <clears throat> if we're walking in the Spirit, if we're doing what the Bible says, we will not be fulfilling the deeds of the flesh, you know, the gossip and the backbiting and the immorality and, and all these things. We won't be doing that stuff. We'll be too busy doing what the Bible says. We won't be fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Every believer should be involved in the harvest or the family business one way or the other. I didn't say family business a couple weeks ago, but that's what it is. The kingdom of God is really the family business, right? God gives us grace to do what he's called us to do. Now note, you may not feel like you have grace from God to do something. The grace isn't there until you actually start doing it. Right? The grace isn't there until you start doing it. When I, the, I remember years ago when I was at the Open Bible Church, and I was, I was on, maybe it was before I was on the Board of Advisors, and um, I'd be asked to to uh, read something for the um, for the offering. Come up with a scripture for the offering and read it and, and pray and all that. And, of course, I'm nervous and I'm scared. But as soon as I got behind the pulpit and as soon as I opened my mouth, I felt that grace. I felt that mantle drop on me. As soon as I got behind and opened my mouth, I felt that come on me. And I was cool. I was good. As long as I didn't focus on my own fear, I was good. And... I felt God's presence with me. Until I opened my mouth, until I went up there and opened my mouth, I didn't feel anything. <laughs> I didn't feel no grace. I didn't feel anything. It wasn't until I actually went and did what I was asked to do that the grace of God was there. So, and finally, I think we wrapped up somewhere around this next point. Um, it's not what we think that counts. It's not what we know that counts. Doesn't it really boil down to what we do? Right? Faith comes by hearing the words of Christ. Faith without works is dead. I'll show you my faith by what I do. I'll show you I love you by what I do, not by what I say. I mean, I, you gotta you gotta use the words too, but but actions speak much louder than words. I'll show you I love you by serving you. Jesus said in Matthew twenty twenty six, "Whoever would be great among you must be your servant." You want to be great in God's kingdom? Put on your servant clothes. Right? Put on those servant garments. Men may not see you as great when you do that, but God sees you from heaven's perspective. And that's what really counts. All right, now for today. <clears throat> and some of this is probably going to be a little challenging. In fact, some of it I may have to just not do, but I've really prayed about this. And Lord, what do you want me to say? And... Um, so bear with me if something stings. Just put it on the shelf and maybe you can use it. Rebuke or repent. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's funny. <laughs> whatever, you know, what whatever it is. I mean when and and the thing is, and anybody that's prepared a message knows that that the message that they prepare, they get it first. Yeah. Right. Sure. They get it first. You know, if it's a strong word, I got it first. Yep. You know, if it's a word full of love and compassion and mercy and just gushing love, I get it first. <laughs> so, anyway. The Bible says that uh, God disciplines us. If he didn't discipline us, then we'd be illegitimate children. Yeah, and so what do we got going on in the world today? We have a whole bunch of kids that haven't been disciplined yeah. properly. And they're completely out of control. They have no direction. All right. So God, God does correct us. They certainly haven't been fathered. They haven't been fathered. Yeah. So they got no direction. Huh? And, and you know probably better than any of us, you know, because of the time you spent ministering in the prison. First Corinthians chapter two, verse one, two, four, and five. For some reason, I left out three, but I don't remember why. Anyway. First Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, 2, 4, and 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So Paul didn't bring messages, apparently, that stimulated the intellect. You know, he didn't bring messages that that's really a good message, Brother Paul, you know. Right? He didn't preach messages that made him look wise in men's eyes, but that were void of power to convict or to deliver, right? In fact, when he came to the Corinthians, he didn't preach anything but the cross. I, I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard that uh, that Paul was actually kind of a balding little guy with a squeaky voice, wasn't it? Didn't have what you'd call a good preaching voice. Yeah, and, and that may and that may be you know, <laughs> one of we imagine at, at least one of the movies that's out there about the Apostle Paul, that's <laughs> the description of Paul. He's a little guy, he's balding, he's insignificant looking. Yeah. Um, that's why he could say God chooses the foolish because it's Right, the to confound the wise. <laughs> right, so in fact, when, uh, when Paul came to the Corinthians, he didn't preach anything but the cross. In fact, that's what verse 2 says, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He just preached the cross. He just preached the cross. I bet there were some people that grumbled about Paul. All he talks about is the cross of Christ over and over, every day. He just talks about the cross. He talks about the cross. Doesn't, know, he, doesn't he know anything else? But Paul came with the message of the cross and the power of the Holy Spirit to back it up, right? He came with the message of the cross to convict people. He came with the power of God to set people free. It was never Jesus' intent to start the church with power and have it run out of gas and have it rely on programs and entertainment to fill the pews and the coffers. If you know what coffers are, that's the, you know, that's... What are coffers? Is it like a coffin? <laughs> it's like the offering. It's like money. It's like oh, the coffers. The coffers. <laughs> it was never his intent to do that for the church to to start out with power and then drop off and become an institution with some really cool music and some really good messages but no power to actually change people's lives. It was never his intent. In fact, I think I can safely say that there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of men and women and young people filling pews that are called by God to be missionaries or pastors, teachers, evangelists, whatever, right? That are just lulled to sleep by the entertainment, by the good messages they're just lulled to sleep there's nothing, to con there's nothing there to convict them, to convince them I need to go nothing there and so we have these mega churches huge mega churches and so many of the people they're just throwing money in the plate and they're doing their, they're doing their service by throwing money in the plate and they're not going so the pastor's driving a Ferrari or whatever <laughs> right I mean it, God doesn't have a problem with us having nice things I mean that's not it that's not the deal at all and, and we all know that but it's it's the fact that that there are so many people that they're just sitting there doing nothing while the big man at the pulpit is doing everything and then those that are volunteering under him you know but but the vast majority of the people are just sitting there Feed me more, feed me more, feed me more. But they never get out of their seats to actually hit the streets. They never get out of their seats to actually set the captives free. <clears throat> I don't know if I want to use this part here or not. It's to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Yeah, he, yeah, so the purpose of the fivefold ministry, some people call it fourfold, but fivefold ministry, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It's not to do the work of the ministry, it's to equip the saints. So the saints do the work of the ministry, right? That's what the purpose of the fivefold. It's not to, I'm, I'm going to do all the work, 
and you guys just pay me to do the work. <laughs> That's not it at all. I am going to, the purpose of the pipe hold is to equip you so that you, that's all of us, do the work of the ministry, right? I think I'll go ahead with this. And it's a little bit meddling, but we've all heard this probably numerous times. There's a passage we may have heard preached from time to time that sometimes is used to keep people in their seats. Say that again. There's a passage that's preached time to time that is used to keep people in their seats. In their seats. Okay. In their seats. Proverbs 18, 16. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. And the way this is usually preached is your gift, if you have a gift from God, that gift will make room for you and you'll be able to operate in ministry. <coughs> but what, and, and the principle is there somewhere. I mean, the principle works to a degree, right? But the gift here has nothing to do with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. The gift here is an offering. It's like money. Okay? <clears throat> so what it's saying is a man's offering, a man's money, whatever he can offer you, offer somebody in authority, whatever he can do to better them will make room for them, will make room for that person has nothing to do with the gifts and calling of God, has nothing to do with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, it has everything to do with what he has that will benefit the person in authority. Whether it's, whether we're talking governments, you know, or churches, or whatever. I mean, it, it works across the board. So that does not mean to say that just because someone's wealthy, they shouldn't serve in that capacity. I'm not saying that at all. I am saying that there are people in positions that have no business being there, but they have money, or they have contacts, or they have influence, so they are given those seats of influence, right? And we have Holy Ghost gifted and called people that are sitting in the churches doing nothing that should be serving. We have Holy Ghost gifted and called people that are sitting in the church that are doing nothing, but they should be serving. A lot of these people, they're not easily noticed. They're quiet. They're introverts. You might not even notice. You, you might never know that they, are, that they are spending the whole night in prayer every night, whatever. You don't know that. They're, they're, but you just look over them because they're, they're not flashy. And they're not making a lot of noise and all this. But they've got the power of God operating in their lives. They've got the wisdom of God operating in their lives. Maybe they don't seem to have a lot to offer the vision, so they get passed over, right? There are any number of reasons or excuses. And I'm not sure Jesus would agree with those church leaders who pass these people over, right? I don't think that Jesus would say, I see what you mean about that woman. I wouldn't have chosen her either. <laughs> she's got no class, and she stutters when she talks. She just wouldn't look good. She doesn't fit our agenda. Good call. I don't think Jesus is doing that. In fact, I think Jesus is going, I remember, I remember reading, I think it was Rick Joyner years ago, one of his books. Um, the Lord showed him in a vision, this man, and I think this was uh, somebody typically you would walk right on by. And the Lord showed him this man, he might, have, he might have been a street guy, and the Lord said, I called you to disciple him, but you ignored him. You were supposed to disciple that guy, but you ignored him. So anyway, let's put all that under our hat for further consideration. You know, down the line we might think about it. Oh yeah, I remember that scripture. So, whatever. Uh, back to today, Jesus said, "These signs shall follow you." Let's look at Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 18. Mark 16, 15 through 18. And he said to them. <coughs> Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues. 
They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover and you drink. Awesome news. We get to heal the sick and cast out devils. But we're not seeing much of it. Right? I'm not sure this morning on the way here, Keith and I were praying and he burped. And I thought maybe he went through some deliverance. <laughs> 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 I, I burped and she, thought, she started laughing at me. <laughs> I think maybe I went through some deliverance. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> Awesome news. We get to heal the sick, heal the sick and cast out devils, but we're not seeing much of it in real life. But this is what we're supposed to be doing. Jesus also said, wait here. Don't go out witnessing, basically, until you receive power. Wait until you receive power. Luke 24, 46. And, oh, okay. Luke 24, 46 through 49. The 24, 46, <clears throat> then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And behold, you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued from power endued with power from on high. So really Jesus was saying, don't go until you have the power. Don't go until you have power. He was also saying, go in power. So not going because we don't have the power is no excuse. Get filled with the Holy Ghost and go. <laughs> All right. Get filled with the Holy Ghost and go. Get filled with the Holy Ghost and go. The Bible does not say to wait until you receive tongues, and then when you've worked through all your stuff, and finally when you're clean enough and perfect enough, you'll receive power to set people free of sickness and oppression. That may be what performance-oriented religion says, but it's not in the Bible. The Bible says, Acts 1.8, But ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. But ye shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Not later, but when. We've all walked with Jesus a lot longer than the apostles did. At this time, the church is really, really young. In fact, when Jesus told them this in, in Acts here, the church wasn't even actually born yet, right? So the longest any of these guys knew Jesus was about three and a half years. We've all been saved for a lot longer than three and a half years. Don't you think that maybe they had some stuff to work through? They've only been saved for three years. For crying out loud, when I was three years old in the Lord... Look out. <laughs> I might be driving 120 miles an hour down the road witnessing to somebody, saying to them, what would you do if we had a wreck? Would you go to heaven or hell? I mean, that's when I was three years old in the Lord. <laughs> I think you had a sticker on your camera. What did you have? I took off all my stickers in my car. It was Jesus is the power of something. You oh, that, was the, that was when uh, Star Wars. Star Wars. <laughs> the source of the power. Yes, oh. Jesus is the source Jeez. of the power. And I'm like, uh, you're driving a camera. Right. So, so, so he could speak. Well, I, I remember people talking about that. I never put bumper stickers on my car, but I remember oh, yeah. people saying that. But uh, but honestly, I did pick up a couple of guys that were hitchhiking one day, and I'm witnessing to these guys because I witnessed to everybody, and I'm driving down the freeway, 110, 120 miles an hour, my in my 71 Ford Galaxy. It would go that fast after the muffler blew up when I was. About 105, it started stuttering, and all of a sudden, Mufford blew up, and the car just took off and flew. But anyway, <laughs> and, and I'm saying, what would happen if we had a wreck? Would you go to heaven or hell? Uh, well, I, I, I don't know. You know, I dropped them off. 
And wouldn't you know, after I was done my business, I headed back the other way. They were hitchhiking the other way. I picked them up, and they rode back the other way with me. They actually got back in the car with me. I guess they figured out there was going to go ahead. I guess. If you had some knowledge, you would have said you thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Yeah, yeah well, I, I wasn't paying much attention to that verse at the time. <laughs> Did not apply. If you're going that fast and you crash, you go to hell right with them. So I was, uh, I was, I was, I used to take the Royal Rangers home from, you know, because I was in the assemblies and I'd help out the Royal Rangers. And I was just a young Christian, you know, like a year so old, old in the Lord. And I'd take them home from church, in you know. Church van, right? Huh? You drive the church van. No, I was driving my car. Oh, you car. And I'm going 100, 110 miles an hour with these Royal Rangers in my car taking them home. Oh, fast. You like to drive fast, huh? Yeah, I was a speed freak. So, um, so I'm thinking that maybe these disciples, apostles, had some stuff to work through. I know I did when I was, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 20, 30, 40 years older than the Lord. Got some stuff to work through. But the Lord never said, get your act together. Right? He just said, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power. When the Holy Ghost is come upon you, you shall receive power. And I saw people healed back then. And I saw people saved back then. I saw stuff happening back then. It had nothing to do with how well behaved I was. I just believed God. <laughs> the part of God that I would, the part of the word that I would accept. There were some things I wouldn't accept. You know, because I didn't have the, I didn't have the light. I just didn't get it. So there was stuff I wouldn't accept. But... Uh, when I believed God on these different things, God showed up and he honored his word, regardless of how much of an idiot I was. You know why? Because God loves people. That's right. God loves people. Um, obviously, if we are in sin and rebellion and idolatry, then we need to confess our sin. Right? Get rid of it. We need to, turn, we need to confess and repent. I did a real short word study on repent. Repent comes from the Greek word, and you guys probably all know this, but repent comes from the Greek word metanoia. It means to change your mind, to reconsider your ways and change your thinking. Yeah. Right? As simple as that. It's as simple as that and as profound as that. If I change my thinking, I'm going to change my ways. If I'm going to change what I think about, I'm going to change what I'm doing. Right? So... Okay, back to waiting. In the upper room, there was an expectancy that something was going to happen, but they didn't know what it would look like. Jesus said, wait. Right? So they're waiting. And I imagine they're worshiping and praising, but they're waiting. Then the Holy Spirit shows up with power at Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit showed up with power, they knew it. There was no mistaking. Something happened, right? The sound of a mighty rushing wind, tongues of fire over their heads, speaking languages they didn't know, and acting like a bunch of drunks. Anybody here been drunk in the spirit? What was it like when you were drunk in the spirit for? What was it like? I was really happy and nothing could make me mad. <laughs> right. Really happy? Did anything happen when you prayed for people? I thought that's oh, what yeah. you were. People got healed. <laughs> yeah. Every, every, so you went through this period of what you said seven months. Everybody, you got you, everybody. You were drunk all the time, happy all the time. Nobody could make you mad, and everybody you prayed for got healed. Uh-huh. That's pretty cool. It is. <laughs> it changes everything when we get filled with the Spirit and really get filled with the Spirit. It changes everything, man. It changes everything. You love everybody, right? You go from being grouchy and critical to I love you, man. I love you, man. You know, and then you fall over because there's a chair in your way or not. You know, but I mean, I went through a lot. I went through that for a few years, years ago. And it was pretty crazy, but you know, something, stuff happened. And people got saved, and people got delivered, and people got healed. It was happening, right? People got saved, people got delivered, and people got healed. We had a, I went to a world conference in 97, 98. It was a Morris-Sorello world conference. T.D. Jakes and Shambach, Brother Shambach and Benny Hinn and, you know, the who's who back then were all preaching. And um, one night after T.D. Jakes service, we had, a re, we, had a, uh, we had a delivery session out on the sidewalk out in front of the Anaheim Convention Center. 
lady comes up and she says, uh, you know, we're, we're just talking to her about the love of God and how he can heal and deliver. And she says, even sangria, which is like a Mexican witchcraft, even sangria, can Jesus deliver me from sangria? Yes, Jesus can deliver you from sangria. And we had a deliverance session right there on the sidewalk in front of the Anaheim Convention Center. So Peter went from a man who a few weeks earlier, and, and I'll be done here in a, about two minutes. Peter went from a man who a few weeks earlier denied he even knew Christ. It was just a few weeks, right? How many days from the crucifixion to Pentecost? 50 days, something like that? Jesus, exactly. huh? Not something like that, exactly. Yeah, 50 days. <laughs> yeah, 50 days, from, 50 days from the crucifixion to Pentecost. Six weeks. Actually, from, from Sunday when he was raised, from Saturday. Yeah, he was already. Yeah. So basically, small, basically small point, but it was a, from yeah. the Saturday Sabbath. Yeah. Seven weeks, must be something to that. Seven yeah, weeks seven, yeah. ago, Peter yeah. denied the Eve and knew Christ. At Pentecost, when he got filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter preached a short sermon, because you can read it there in Acts. Peter preached a short, short sermon, and 3,000 people got saved. Roughly 3,000 people got saved. <coughs> Something happened. Right. <laughs> Something happened. That is exactly right. I think they were having fun working with God. It's a blast. It's just absolutely a blast. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit and things are happening, things are popping everywhere you go, people are getting healed, people are getting delivered, people are just breaking down and bawling because when you pray for them and you say God loves you or something, it just touches their heart and they start breaking down and bawling. I mean, it's cool. It's a lot of fun. <coughs> you might say, well, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit 30 years ago, and man, it was amazing. God was rocking our world, but now not so much. God hasn't changed. We just run out of gas, so to speak. Right? We need to get filled back up now and then. If you do a word search on filled in the New Testament, you'll find it, at least in the New King James, I think 48 times. A lot of those times has to do with being filled with the Spirit and filled with joy and, and all these things. You know. Acts 4.31. This is our last verse. Acts 4.31. <coughs> And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. So it wasn't long ago, two chapters back, but as far as chronology, it wasn't long ago that the Holy Spirit fell. And they're already getting refilled again. They're already getting filled again. Just a few days, weeks ago, the Holy Spirit fell. And they were all filled, baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now they're getting filled again. Jesus customarily went off at night to spend time with his father. I bet he got filled up. I bet he got encouraged. I bet he got filled up. If the early church needed refillings, you can bet that we do too. Right? If Jesus needed to go off by himself to spend some time with his father, then you can bet that we do too. So what do we do? What do we do? Pray, pray, pray some more. You know a lot of that praying, praying some more just needs to be hanging out in God's presence and loving on Him. Not just asking, not with your shopping list. Just hanging out with Him and loving on God. Just hanging out in His presence. Spend a few nights on your face before the Lord, seeking Him and His purpose for your life. Right? His purpose for my life is what really matters anyway. His purpose for our lives. That's what really matters anyway. Worship the Father. Worship Jesus. And worship some more. Maybe skip a few sermons and just worship and love on God. You know, you've, you've mentioned a number of times, you know, till God's, worship till God's satisfied or something like that. You know, just love on God. Just keep on worshiping and loving on God. <clears throat> if we do these things and we just keep pressing in and just love on God, Actively loving God, not just I love God, but actively pursuing that relationship, actively pursuing and developing that relationship. I guarantee you, good things are going to happen. Absolutely. 
Not everybody's going to be happy about it. You'll get some persecution from the outside because the devil's going to see what's going on, and, and he'll work on other people to work on you. You know, you'll find yourself where you've been so tuned in with the Lord this morning and this afternoon snapping at somebody like they're your enemy because the devil is going to try to quench what you've got going with the Lord. He's trying to shut it down because it's a threat. Okay. God has so much for us. He's given us everything. He's holding nothing back. God is holding nothing back. It's on us, right? It's really on us. Father, we love you. Lord, we love you today. We love you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. And Lord, our desire is to cooperate with you and to work with you. you your word says that we are co-laborers, joint heirs and co-laborers with our God. And our desire is to is to truly, accurately, fully be co-laborers with our God and working together with you. So we welcome you, Lord. We welcome you, Lord, to wreck us for yourself, Lord. We welcome you, Lord, to wreck us with your love. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord brought a song to my mind that we may all know. Fill my cup. Fill my cup.